let's uh, get started. Uh, today I'm going to remember to introduce everybody. Uh, uh, to start with, we have uh, Greg Jarobi. J I hope I pronounce that. Or Jarbo, is it? I'm sorry. Jarbo, Jar Jarbo, Jarbo, although I have been called worse. Okay. <laughs> and Greg's from uh, SEOPR and does a lot of the uh, work with video for uh, SES, Search Engine Strategies. And Greg and I will be uh, doing a presentation on video uh, at Search Engine Strategies Toronto. So uh, we're hoping y'all come out and visit us and, you know, see what we have to say. And uh, our second guest is also uh, part of the SES alumni, uh, uh, Jonathan Allen, used to be Search Engine Watch uh, webmaster and uh, the list of awards that Jonathan has won is just astounding. Too many to go into them all, so we'll just skip them. And of course, uh, as usual, Steve, my sidekicker here, and the usual group from the dojo is uh, hanging about. And, uh, hopefully, we'll have some questions this week. So I thought I'd start by uh, mentioning that uh, one of the uh, a recent study on uh, Social Media Explorer, I believe that's the name of the site, they did a report and it said that one of the things that marketers are looking at, especially in social media, is expanding their video. Uh, what's kind of disconcerting is that's been the, the norm for three years. So it's kind of like uh, mobile where it's been on everybody's mind for three years, but nobody's actually gotten around to doing it. Now, I think like uh, uh, with mobile, there's a few barriers to, uh, to getting into video, and maybe that's how Jonathan, myself, and Greg, and maybe some of the other guys can kind of show people or give them some ideas on how you get around those barriers. Uh, Greg, how would you like to uh, start? Well... Let's put it this way. There have been a lot of things on people's to-do list over the last couple of years that nobody got to because of the economy. And nobody was boosting marketing budgets generally. So guess what? YouTube stayed on the brink of the verge of the edge of the next thing to do um, for a couple of years. But I think one of the things we've been seeing in 2013 is that people are coming up for air. It looks like maybe if the economy isn't totally back, it's starting to come back. And so some of those things on the to-do list, including video, are, are starting to get tackled. So, you know, let's not beat up ourselves entirely. There, there were other things going on out there in the world. But, um, yeah, video has its own set of um, production questions or issues. And there's this uh, sort of enduring myth that you need to have television production quality before you can even start. And you know what? Uh, if you're in a music video category, you probably do want high quality production because that's, that's what everyone else has and you're competing with them. But in a whole lot of either B2B or even in some B2C categories, um, the production quality is less and less of an issue than the actual content. Cool. And uh, Jonathan, what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd agree with um, Greg that production quality, um, you know, shouldn't be a blocker to you getting um, getting on YouTube and creating some stuff. Um, it's something I've been working on uh, quite recently, like you know, turning text and photos into video um, and that can be compelling and that can still target search terms and create a body of content and start to kind of give people reasons to subscribe that then when you do do some high quality content it's got more chance of popping. Um, with mobile it's actually very remarkable how many mobile ads there are, um, you know, true view ads are appearing on mobile devices now um, and so you know one way to experiment with mobile I think is to try TrueView ads because um, 
you get pretty good analytics off it and you can really kind of try out lots of different formats and um, because you can get quite big quite a lot of reach quite quickly um, you know I, I think it's a good way to go to kind of see you know what could resonate in a purely mobile crowd versus you know your desktop crowd and things like that mm -hmm. yeah one of the uh, things that I think uh, also comes into play is if you are targeting video for different parts of the uh, sales funnel for instance there's times when you don't have to have that recorded video uh, adding music to a slide share and repurposing that into a video will provide uh, that extra audience from the video but it gets though that for that uh, stage in the sales funnel it's actually a better way than having a person talking uh, that's my opinion uh, it's picking your right spot in the uh, sales funnel for that type of video uh, that has a lot to do with it and if you use video in that way the production isn't as much of a, a factor because I did my first on a little piece of software from MS that's on uh, uh, their live part of their live uh, group of tools very simple stuff uh, I don't had very little training and I had no problem putting together my first videos uh, so I think that's been a bit of the problem is like uh, Greg said the the uh, quality and the thinking that it's all got to be this uh, like television quality when in fact it uh, doesn't and they may also make files that are much bigger than what uh, a lot of we can handle on the internet I'm not too sure about that part so one of the other things that I found is that for social uh, media and social media networking sites, video is huge. That uh, you can gain an audience really quickly by using video as an enticement. Uh, for instance, uh, when we started out with SEL Pros on G+, we were getting no traction at all. We started these hangouts and, you know, we're 10 times the size that we were uh, just by adding it. And zero production value takes an hour of our time once a week. And the uh, traffic that it's driving is, like, excellent. Uh, still looking at the ROI hasn't been very long yet. So we'll We'll see as that unfolds. Uh, any thoughts on that, Jonathan? I know you're heavy on the uh, social media, so we'll start with you and then go to uh, Greg. Yeah, well, so, like, one thing that, um, you know, just going back to this idea of production values, um, one thing I've been looking a lot at is using animation and, yeah, animation tools and things like that to at least take user-generated content and turn that into video. So, you know, um, lots of brands are now thinking about becoming publishers and becoming communities and, you know, they want to crowdsource a lot of content from their sort of most passionate advocates and um, things like that. And yet these people, you know, they often have a kind of interest in producing content but they don't necessarily want to be on camera. Uh, they're, you know, they're camera shy, and so we've been turning that content into animations and, um, you know, text, text-based video and things like that. And that's been a really good way of, um, you know, allow using user-generated content um, and turning it into video. And then the other aspect of it is like. What I like about video is if you can do it in a kind of relatively timeless way. I mean, if you to get the really high traffic, video needs to be newsworthy like anything else. But good timeless video content can constantly be reused and can be relevant to a kind of a new status update on Facebook. Uh, you know, can be you could use the same video in a few status updates um, on on. 
uh, Twitter and Facebook and things like that. But I think the other thing that's nice about um, video is that it is it is shareable. It is more easy for people to kind of quickly get 30 seconds of content and kind of get the message. And uh, reading isn't always like the best way to kind of pass your message around. And like you, we are seeing like really cool stuff happening on Vine now. People are using Vine to create some nice images and cinema, cinemagram as well. Which okay, it's not video, but it's like animated photo. There's some quite cool stuff happening there as well. So I think you know these moving media formats are just they just help you get more likes, more retweets. You know, and then more followers, and the more followers you've got, the more chance you've got of launching a successful product in the long run. And your thoughts, Gray? Yeah, I I, I agree with uh, Jonathan, and and I I blog for both uh, Real SEO and Search Engine Watch, and virtually every um, post that I do on Real SEO has embedded video. And, and at least half of the ones that I uh, write on Search Engine Watch have embedded video. And it makes sense. It uh, engages the readers. Um, it's one of the reasons why um, um, more and more bloggers um, will have at least a photo, but if they can, uh, a video uh, in, in every post. I've also seen recently uh, a data point that about 500 years worth of YouTube video is watched every day on wow. Facebook. So um, uh, again, you can actually set up auto sharing in uh, YouTube so that your video, once it's uploaded, is automatically uh, shared to your uh, company's uh, Facebook page. That's another way to um, uh, engage a whole different set of uh, people beyond uh, the ones who uh, discover your video on a YouTube channel. And one of the really funny and surprising things that most uh, marketers overlook is you can take your YouTube video and embed it on your website. And again, somehow or other, there, there seems to be this disconnect that says, oh, video is for social media. Well, the answer is video can go in a lot of places, and your website is one of them. Yeah, David and I at uh, uh the dojo, we've had a lot of success with uh, taking, this, basically curating SEO video. We got like about 700 now, I think, on there. And uh, we drive a lot of traffic to the website because of those videos. People knowing we've curated them and set them up so they're easier to find. You can find related ones. They're all set in playlists. It's good stuff. and. One of the things I wanted to mention is that uh, when uh, it's for a video does not have to go viral for a channel to be successful. For instance, the first channel I ever worked on has had 28 million downloads, has 13,000 subscribers, and not one of the videos has 10,000 views, downloads. Yeah, I, I I I totally agree, and and I got to share um, a case study at SES Chicago about a year and a half ago uh, about a video that had been produced uh, by the folks at Aura Brush, and it was an unlisted video. In other words, you couldn't watch it unless you had somebody send you the link, and they had produced this video just for the buyer at Walmart that they were trying to get you know national retail distribution. They wanted him to sort of, uh, please, let's set up a meeting, whatever. And so they did a custom video just for him, just for Michael. They sent him the link. If you look at the video today, I think it may have 1,300 views, which is like peanuts. But what happened was Michael put in the order. And Aura Brush didn't get a meeting. What they got was an order for like 700,000 units for 3,500 stores nationwide from Walmart because of one unlisted video. So again, you don't have to go viral for, for your message to uh, move the needle. Right. And there's also uh, 
getting your uh, uh, video into Google is one thing that a uh, uh, few numbers come to mind. One is uh, that uh, over 60% of SERPs have a video in them. And that's a pretty high number. I can't think of any other element that has that high uh, saturation. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Search metrics has released some new data that, that actually shows that that percentage is now up to 75%. So it has grown. What I think was amazing, though, is when they then dug into the data to say, OK, where are those videos coming from? 80% of that 75% were coming from YouTube. Number wow. two on the list, interestingly enough, was daily motion. That was at about 15%. And everybody else like carved up the last 5%. So um, again, daily motion, we've done a little work with it from time to time for the occasional client, particularly ones based in France. But I was surprised to see in the United States how much daily motion was like number two behind YouTube. And they're uh, shorter videos, correct? You can't do like real long ones for that, can you? Um, no, Daily Motion doesn't have any uh, particular time limits. It's it's um, it's a video sharing site just like YouTube is, and oh, okay, yeah, it, it's it it just it's owned by the French phone company, so a lot of people overlook it. But it's it's one of the, in fact, one of the reasons Yahoo took a look at acquiring. Daily Motion until the French government um, put a halt to that was because it was number two. For sure. Okay, that's an interesting fact. I was not aware of that. Uh, there's a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, one from Doc, which were he says we can wait till later, but uh, MedLink Solution uh, asked. Uh, What's an acceptable time to re see results from a video campaign? It depends on what your objective is. Yeah. So if you're impatient, you want some. You want to see results in the first three days, because theoretically that's when the viral video peaks. But not every video needs to be viral, as as we indicated um, with with the Aura Brush example. Um, there, you want the response to be the buyer to call you up and order your product. And so, uh, how, how long did that take? God, maybe a week. Yeah, it can be yeah, taken. I, eight, uh, eight months. Go ahead, Jonathan. Sorry. I, I'd say that, yeah, I agree, again, agree with Greg. You know, it depends on your goals. But uh, in my experience, um, you know, 24 hours and stuff starts to happen. And if it's going to go viral, um, there's this sort of 24 hour to 48 hour moment where um, it could it could hit another time zone and go viral when you're asleep. Yeah. And that's really exciting. And um, you know, so like in in some of the stuff I've done, like. Now I kind of deliberately factor in uh, kind of time zones and teasers to other countries um, in videos in case that that can be a, a kind of way to make it go viral. Um, the other thing is um, just going back to kind of daily motion and and all these other sites. You know, YouTube is not necessarily the best seed for uh, making video go viral. And I give you a classic example like Cassette Boy. Uh, every cassette boy video basically goes viral, but um, it's not YouTube where um, it's really kind of getting its distribution. I mean, I think some of the kind of people who are really kind of power users on YouTube are subscribed to his channel, so get his latest update. But the first thing we do is put it on Twitter and put it on Facebook, and that's where you get the kind of critical mass for it then to really kind of go viral. So I think. You know, in terms of like video results, you kind of almost want to kind of give yourself kind of three or four posts or markers to work with. So you want to drip feed it into what are the best results we can get just from releasing it on our blog. What's the sec 
what results can you hope for? Then dripping it, drip feeding it into Facebook and social networks. And you want to kind of actually try and do deliberately limited distribution, uh, but with the right people, and that can help it kind of set a light and 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 go um, go viral. Then, so I mean, my best example it, uh, was leaking stuff exclusively through Facebook, and um, and then public and then giving a public version of the video once it kind of got demand and recognition from bloggers and they wanted a version to embed. But sometimes, yeah, the best things can be done in a very small, active group. And I think that's the other thing. Because we come from a background of, we think video is still TV, um, we don't think in terms of these kind of tiny little engaged communities. And actually, if you look at what's really happening in second screen and stuff like that, you know, it's not about, Twitter's not banking on second screen, screen being all about mass distribution. It's about connecting with these kind of key influencers and tastemakers early on in the cycle that help it explode. And, um, you know, there was that, there was that uh, restaurant that were kind of abusing everyone on their Facebook page. But that clip came from TV with uh, Gordon Ramsay. But I think it was the kind of, the few people, it was the clip going on Facebook that suddenly escalated recognition of this episode and Gordon Ramsay and Hell's Kitchen in general. Yeah, I, I think this ability just takes care of uh, Byron. That's uh, my first. Yeah, I, I, I have to, I have to um, endorse what Jonathan just said. Uh, particularly the mainstream media hates being pushed into trying to cover your latest video. It's like they've got all their defense mechanisms up, right? So um, one of the tactics that we've discovered uh, that seems to work quite nicely is if you give a heads up uh, that your new video uh, is going to go up, you know, pick an odd time of the day, to uh, bloggers in Australia. They love it because too many people ignore Australia, so they may jump on the trend first. Interestingly enough, bloggers in Australia are watched like a hawk by bloggers in the UK. And so, again, as Jonathan said, as the sun <laughs> sets in one place, all of a sudden it's coming up in the next, and, and the UK is looking for the, 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 the latest trend, and they jump on it. And then by the time the East Coast of the United States wakes, wakes up, it's like, oh, my God, it's a global phenomena, and uh, they jump on it, too. And so instead of trying to work the hard way and go in the, uh, you know, pitch the mainstream media on the East Coast, if you go sideways, around the world, uh, sometimes you, you end up getting where you want to go um, by going um, the other way around. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one thing and that also, I, you know, I, like Netflix has just done, Netflix is, you know, Arrested Development is a really kind of interesting story of like triumph of the internet over big media because, you know, Fox, like, you know, ditched Arrested Development, the comedy show, after three seasons, and ditched it very unceremoniously. It just kind of got written to an end, and that was it. And it's bloggers and Facebook and just the online communities just being like, I love Arrested Development. And Netflix picked up on that and recommissioned it. And now they got their highest traffic day ever on Netflix. This just on Sunday. Yeah, I was seeing that, and they have a pretty good fan base, so I'm thinking Netflix is thinking that they can drive subscriptions of Netflix from people who want to see that show, kind of like a cable broadcast uh, network, because uh, there's fanatics of that show in particular. Uh, including including two of my kids. Yeah. <laughs> who were briefing me on the latest update of where it was coming and when the frozen banana stand was actually opening up in LA and it, you know, it was kind of like, I, I, I missed the first, you know, uh, 
go round uh, for this, but my kids wouldn't let me miss the second. Yeah. And I agree. Uh, I was going to say that uh, quite often I can kind of tell uh, what's going to happen with the video by what happens in the first couple of days. It's either going to resonate with an audience or it's not. That's why when we started doing the hangouts, one of the first things that I decided is, okay, I'm going to start taking short excerpts out of these and posting them because they're too long. I can, uh, in the long run, you got to take the good bits to really, and then I'll use them to kind of promote the, the rest of it so people watch the whole thing. That's the way I'm kind of leaning. Uh, but uh, uh, to move on, uh, there's been a, a, another question asked, and this is one uh, that's, uh, I don't think there are a lot of tools for this, and that's for uh, measuring and tracking your videos. I uh, think you have GA and the analytics in uh, Google, and perhaps what you get in Flash Player with Adobe, but uh, other than that, not really good stuff happening out there for analytics and video, eh? Well, the the one group that I've seen that is probably doing it better than anyone else in terms of third party um, is Social Bakers. Uh, they're based over in the UK. And one of the things that I like about them is in addition to tracking YouTube, uh, they actually um, you know made their reputation tracking Facebook and then added Twitter and now they're working on, I think, LinkedIn and Google+. And, and one of the things that that enables a marketer to see is to say, okay, okay, so the video took off on YouTube, but guess what? A lot of the things that will drive that are tweets. A lot of things that will drive that is uh, shares on uh, Facebook. So, so you really do need that multidimensional view to get a sense of what's happening off of YouTube but frankly is driving uh, success on YouTube. Right, so you probably need a uh, more of a dashboard that'll pr pull in the social and your YouTube analytics and uh, maybe even some GA as well to, to, to mesh in the conversion. Uh, yeah, and, well. and, the, and, and the best dashboard that I had seen was called Social Snap. Uh, unfortunately, their funding ran out, and if you go to the socialsnap.com site, you'll discover that their uh, technology, which I thought was really uh, impressive, is now up for sale. So it's it's uh, it's a pity, but but uh, you know the best dashboard group out there um, didn't 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 make the cut. Right, uh, but I think. Uh, there's zappies for almost every one of those. So I think someone uh, like Raven is going to get smart and kind of put those all into one dashboard. It uh, uh, seems like the smart thing to do if you want to really keep track of video and see the total picture rather than a whole bunch of snapshots off of different places. Uh, Jonathan, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean... Um, you know, back in the day, I was always recommending, oh, I can't even remember the name now, um, but, you know, it was one way you could upload Tube Mogul. I used to really recommend that when I was interested in distributing video across lots of different networks, but these days I tend only to be really interested in YouTube. But um, I totally agree that um, from a marketing standpoint, um, you need more than just YouTube, but I think YouTube analytics is brilliant and um, it's absolutely brilliant. I love it. And um, you know, obviously, length of you know attention drop off is always interesting um, if you're really kind of familiar with the video and you know kind of all the key points in the video for yourself. Like attention drop off is worth looking at, um, but you know. All the stuff around first embedded on uh, Google referrals versus YouTube referrals and the query that you get in YouTube analytics is really, really useful information. Um, and then obviously using that same information across uh, videos from other types, you know, 
And, and whereas before I used to think of it as competitive information, I now think of it as relationship building information, you know? And you get a sense of like, who are the YouTubers who are kind of getting the traffic you're interested in and who could you work with? Um, but then, yeah, I totally agree. As Greg said, it's like Facebook likes, tweets, all these things, tweets on a hashtag, these are all kind of important things as well. And nowadays, I'm finding that Topsy is just has to be part of the mix. I, I, I'm like always looking, whatever kind of SEO project or marketing project I'm looking at, I'm also kind of getting a sense of what's going on on Topsy because Topsy just really kind of la adds a layer of context to all the kind of social goings on around a particular subject. Yeah, they're also pretty good at uh, tracking the retweets better than most, correct? Yeah, I feel That's like Top is more yeah. accurate than anything else I've seen. And, you know, what, what's good about Topsy is, like, you could look for videos shared on a hashtag, and that kind of gives you a sense of what's resonating with people, um, you know, compared to your video. And I'll give you an example, like, Chris Cross, you know, when Chris Cross died, um, it was really interesting the kind of variety of videos that people would share. Like, obviously, the, there was the song, the original song, but some people were also sharing kind of lesser known songs from Chris Cross. Other people were sharing kind of video interviews and things like that. And there were a lot of kind of interesting thematic trends that emerged uh, from that that you could see through Topsy. Um, and then I've been kind of, you know, looking at kind of second screen behaviors uh, using Topsy. And what's interesting there is, you know, a very, a very niche uh, TV show like Orchestra of Exiles, which was on PBS and was about, you know, what has now become like the Israeli National Philharmonic Orchestra. There's kind of, there was interesting clips and related clips being shared. Um, from YouTube on Twitter uh, simultaneously, and um, you know, there's we we used to say that oh, online video is all about bite-sized content and, and nothing else. Whereas now, I think with kind of second screen behaviors, it's not that people just want bite-sized content; it's that they're able to consume bite-sized content simultaneously with long-form content, and that's much clearer now. Yeah. Uh, Wissam asked a question that I get often asked, and I'm sure you guys as well, it's the same thing. Uh, Self-hosted or YouTube hosted? <laughs> uh, oh, can we yeah. go down that road, gentlemen? Oh, no, no, no. Jonathan and I were both speaking last summer at SES Toronto, and, and the photo that uh, Evan Carmichael grabbed of the expression, Jonathan, on your face, when I answered this question and was memorialized, was, let's put it this way: Jonathan and I have different points of view on this one. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> Jonathan, you want to go first, or you want me to? Uh, you you go first. All right, all right. I'm not sure what you're going to say. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, yeah. This could be scary again. So everyone, watch Jonathan's expression here. Um, one of the things that we've discovered is that the so-called benefit of self-hosting um, sort of has evaporated over the years, only nobody noticed. And uh, the benefit of hosting uh, a YouTube video on your website or embedding it on your website has actually um, gives you the benefit of having video on your website, and there's absolutely benefits to having video on your website without the associated costs because YouTube's doing the hosting so you don't need extra servers uh, and things like that and the other hidden benefit is that uh, because your YouTube video views even when they are distributed and they're hosted on a website or a blog or wherever they are get counted in the YouTube algorithm the likelihood of your video then ranking in Google is improved 
if you are taking that video from YouTube and again putting it on your website and we worked with a, a company two years ago who at the time last summer Jonathan I couldn't disclose their name because they hadn't like they were still keeping this as a trade secret but but the but the good news is they have recently uh, approved that it's okay to disclose blah 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 so um, the company we were working with is called Sonosite S O N O S I T E they are a medical device uh, a company they they use uh, portable ultrasound and point of care ultrasound uh, so it's a healthcare um, uh, technology and they literally pulled the second version of every video that they were creating because they were creating two one for the website one for their YouTube channel pulled the second one off saving money in production embedded the YouTube video on their channel and in the last two years in addition to blowing by their biggest competitor GE Healthcare on YouTube which they were delighted with started generating significant traffic to their website and that traffic was converting into lead generation and they were growing at a pretty healthy clip last year when uh, the rest of the healthcare industry was sort of standing on one foot waiting to find out if Obamacare was going to be considered constitutional or not and Fujifilm stepped in and acquired them for 995 million dollars so um, you know, is that all because they swapped out their video no I'm sure they had a great product and they were doing a lot of other things uh, appropriately too but the point was is that YouTube was a significant contributor to their success and um, they got over this notion of they had to host different video on their website they just were embedding YouTube video on their website okay uh, you go Jonathan and then I'll go I think we're, we're kind of in the same uh, boat I mean, yeah, I gotta say, like, I kind of feel like, you know, we may as well just do YouTube generally for the average person. Um, obviously, if you want to monetize your own video content, then you're gonna need your own player. Um, but I kind of am at the point now where I'm sick of clicking play on the Guardian, Huffington Post, and all the different, you know, video sites that. You know, sites that are visit that have video content just to sit through a 30 second ad to then watch a 15 second clip of a kitten. Um, you know, I'm, I'm finding that experience pretty annoying, and Google have cracked this kind of skippable ad model. Um, but yeah, I kind of agree with Greg, it's just like there's not much point. I mean, I am always interested in all the new players that come out that kind of promise to do kind of interesting overlay uh, features and kind of the ability to kind of sign up for an e you know, put your email address in the video in or embed tweets in, in the timeline of the video and stuff like that. But to be honest, there hasn't been anything that's kind of really like set me alight. Um, and then, yeah, it kind of comes down to the analytics. Like, I feel like every single uh, bit of analytics data you get on from Google and YouTube, particularly on what queries they're using to find that video, is just gold dust and gives you more impetus and momentum to carry on developing videos than when you just put it in a kind of player that you, you just can't get any other information out of. So, yeah, I'm kind of... I just stick with YouTube these days. I mean, I mean, but I, I, I SEO see. Mods always seem to be using Wistia, and that yeah. kind of looks good. So um, that might be worth checking out. I mean, I, I see big brands actually moving away from YouTube and just self-hosted their own videos. I mean, you know, uh, you know, other than uh, the, have you know acquiring the whole traffic. If you know people know that okay, I don't need to go to YouTube to find a how to something about something. I go to Sears and they have their own video section, and I I, I can find this type of you know information. Um, yeah. Well, then I, I I would really strongly recommend that you um, look for the article that I wrote on Real SEO. It's entire uh, it's entitled something like. Um, the video SEO wars are over and YouTube has won and 
the gist is uh, all the data comes from search metrics, yeah. and and uh, that's that's then again where I saw the seventy five percent of the um, you know um, Google Universal search results have video in them. Eighty percent of that comes from uh, YouTube. Fifteen percent comes from you know um, uh, the French company and and. In that list, which I found absolutely mind blowing, was eHow, because eHow does it both ways. They've got their own hosted yeah. video, and oh, by the way, they have a YouTube channel. And interestingly enough, eHow was in the single digits. I mean, like one or two percent, as opposed to the YouTube video versions. Mm -hmm. And if you if you want to see this, all you have to do is uh, search for this is a funny term, but it's the one I've been using at um, uh, conferences, uh, SES conferences is is how to bunny hop on a BMX bike and you yep. will find three or four different videos in the top results and three of them are from YouTube and the fourth one I think is from ehow.com yeah so, uh, just to add to that ehow we have uh, in the dojo a little uh, inside info we the uh, one of the SEOs from there. We know that when uh, uh, Panda originally hit, they uh, went hot, strong on to video from Dex to get around the big content stuff. Uh, that was part I mean, of their plan. Uh, one thing as well, it is worth noting that like Sclipo, Howcast, Video Jog, all those ones. Do have a specific audience for how-to type content, yeah. And you know, so again, about hitting niches and stuff, or perfecting content for bigger, more mainstream audiences like YouTube. You could use, you know, Howcast and uh, Video Jug for those kind of things. Also, the only thing that is a bit odd about YouTube is like uploading ads or kind of clearly promotional material. Um, and that's maybe where it kind of seems more tasteful to try and use a self-hosted version. Yeah, you want to have. Uh, yeah, you want to have some kind of angle on your uh, really heavily promotion stuff because uh, that doesn't go over too well on uh, YouTube, in my experience. When I was working with the the. Uh, music company where we got all the downloads we started by having the company's reps come in and do the videos my god it went over like a lead balloon thank yeah. god someone i watched the comments and got every time these guys are saying these guys from the corporations are just talking heads they want real players they want opinions from people who are also playing those instruments so Right away, we tore, told the corporate guys, nope, we're doing them all right here in our own studio. And that's when the whole program took off. Yeah, and, and, and your content, by the way, which is a crucial piece of success, whether you're self-hosted or you're on YouTube, you know, is a whole separate decision. You, you can make corporate propaganda and host it on your site. You can make corporate propaganda hosted on YouTube. It it uh, probably sucks in both places, so um, you know the net net is what the modern audience is coming to expect is more transparency, more authenticity, and oh by the way, less propaganda. That's social in general, though, right, Greg? You can say that about almost any social site. I, I, I know, and as an old PR guy who used to specialize in corporate propaganda, it meant I had to make some adjustments, which are painful, but yeah. nevertheless, I think that's that's the right advice today. Yeah, and I'll just say that I've been a long time, Jonathan will tell you, proponent of the YouTube over self-hosting. Wisdom and I have had many discussions about <laughs> Arguments. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't argue. We have heated debates. Yeah, uh, but I, 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 I think I mean that. I mean, the the thing is with the content you're developing, you put money on it, and if you put it on YouTube, you have all these 
ripping, you know, people ripping, uh, ripping it and put put it on their own channel, and you have to, you know, do the maintenance after that. So it's it's a it's a hassle. And if you if you go to the self-hosted have self-hosted route, in a way, in a way you control it. And if they do actually embed it, you benefit in a way from it, as from the whole authority of the site. And from a topical relevance point of view, I mean, I think, you know, having a video from, you know, an SEO or real SEO dot com, talk about, talking about video SEO have more topical relevance than, uh, you know, uh, an SEO SEO video about video SEO on, you know, videojock dot com. Yeah, yeah, and and I I would say a couple of years ago I, I was a little more. I don't know, ecumenical about this, but but um, you know, one of the things that uh, sort of swung me over, and, and, and I'm not naturally a YouTube bigot, although it sometimes appears that I am, um, is the fact that they have significantly improved their web analytics. Uh, in the early days, there was none, and then they had uh, YouTube Insight, which was lame. Um, but a year and a half ago, they introduced YouTube Analytics, and suddenly all the complaints that I used to have about the data went away. And and then uh, when, when it comes to uh, they're ripping us off, uh, again, uh, partly I think it was triggered by the Viacom lawsuit, uh, YouTube rolled out Content ID. So if you have a problem with people ripping off your content, uh, YouTube has a program where you actually make money when people rip you off. You get uh -huh. to monet, you get to monetize your content because they've got you know basically the the audio print of uh, uh, who, who originated this, and if somebody uploads a, a ripped off version, uh, it identifies it as yours, and you can monetize it. So so again, it, it, you know, a couple of years ago, I would have totally agreed with you and said it depends. N nowadays. It, it just seems YouTube um, has responded uh, quickly enough that it, it has addressed most of those issues. For me, Greg, it's always been yeah. about the fact that the best metrics to uh, find quality in video are only metrics that you can get from YouTube. So if you're self-hosting it, Google had nothing to really go by. Except for maybe links into that web page, but when it comes to video, in my experience, links is not a big contributor to ranking. Yeah, can I just like again agree with that? Like the the um you know the fact that YouTube is kind of sorting out all the kind of piracy and royalty problems for you is just amazing, and. You know, it gives a good song behind your video, uh, gives it again a bit more chance of success and watchability, and and the fact you really don't, all you have to do is acknowledge that your that that copyright is taken, and then they'll monetize it and sort that whole relationship out for you is just really really useful, and um, and yeah, exactly, it's like plays on a video is still just really powerful. And help rank, um, you know, regardless of just kind of links and stuff like that. Yeah. But just stuff like, you know, Zappos has a video demonstration of every single shoe on their site, yeah. and it would be pretty ridiculous if that was sat on YouTube. But you know what? Uh, I like that kind of stuff. In fact, for me, I've always said that those are the types of products in e-commerce that video actually works for. Video worked with an instrument company because the players could see the instruments being played, which to, if you know uh, guitar players, they care about what that guitar may look like hanging off of them. Not just the way it sounds, but also the way it looks hanging off of them. I think it's the same with shoes. So stuff that you would normally go to a store to get a tactile uh, feeling for a product, when there's video attached to it, I think it makes that product more sellable online. And that's kind of what our data showed on the uh, 
uh, musical website as well. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Jonathan? Well, again, like, you know, go to, yeah, if you check out um, Zappos, the, the shoe videos, they're weirdly funny. Like, somehow he makes a joke about shoes and kind of has this kind of very amiable demeanor that is funny. And you do want to sh um, share it, but um, oddly enough, sharing the Zappos video about a trainer you see is actually kind of a little bit awkward and doesn't render very well on the social network. And that's all self-hosted, so that, that, that's kind of ironic. But yeah, there's also I... like systems for building uh, animated videos out of sitemaps, and those are quite cool as well. Yeah, I, yeah I, did, I did a story for Search Engine Watch uh, a couple years ago on how Piper Aircraft had used a YouTube video for a brand new plane they were introducing in the United States called the Piper Sport. And the plane cost $140,000, which is not in my price range, but apparently is a pretty aggressive low price if you're buying an airplane for a training school. And their YouTube video and their Facebook page and Twitter um, uh, feed helped sell 15 of these before the product was even available in the United States. And that was, again, uh, prospective pilots wanted to see it. And, you know, if you're announcing it in January at a, an air show, but the product's not available in April, the only way they could get a look at it uh, was on YouTube. And apparently that was enough for 15 people to, to place an order. Yeah, also it would be a game, uh, Greg, where someone who's uh, experienced in that trade would be able to see the plane, what it's doing, and saying, oh, that's what I need. That's going to fill my needs. So uh, I think that's uh, one of the keys for e-commerce and video is knowing where you should be placing that video in the funnel. So we had uh, video on every one of our landing pages. Well, that, that's an actually a very interesting question because that was actually one on the list that you had let us know about ahead of time. What's yeah. the funnel? And and I think the the you know best research I ever saw on the so-called funnel was conducted by uh, Gord Hotchkiss a couple of years ago when he when his firm was still called Enquiro before he he joined the. Uh, yellow pages up there in Canada. And uh, w what they discovered was the funnel isn't a funnel at all. It's more like a maze. And if you understand that, then getting people through the maze, it helps if you can energize them in some way. And in a lot of cases, video uh, can truly help you uh, give people an emotional connection um, to an inanimate product that uh, a really well written description, um, you know, on a on a web page, um, you know, can give you the specs and the feeds and maybe a feel for the product, but but a lot of times video can tell the story better. True. Uh, what was it? I was reading a distilled uh, report, and they said uh, a picture's worth a thousand words, a video's worth a thousand words times twenty five frames a second. <laughs> which I thought was a pretty good quote. So you may hear that come June. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Uh, so we were talking about the content funnel, and I think that's where people have to kind of uh, start analyzing for video is what's going to do best for my uh, users here? What is going to be more useful? text or video or pictures or combinations and that's where you use it. Uh, you have to kind of pick the right spots so that you're basically using the right tool at the right time. Kind of like, you know, I have this saying, uh, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks You just you just got um, muted out there for a second. Oh, I did. How's that better? Oh yeah, well, you're back. Okay. So uh, basically, what I just said was, th 
that video has a place and text has a place in the uh, sales funnel. And part of the deal now is finding the best place for them. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah, so, you know, I think the panda in, you know, if there's any inspiration we should take from panda and penguin, it's that, you know, 90% of search results are still pretty rubbish. And, you know, one thing, one thing, you know, on the question of media types, um, you know, if you want to target above the funnel, often you'll find, like, these really generic phrases are the ones that have been absolutely spammed to death. And, you know, there's only a couple of clear winners. And um, in general, that content is still bad. And I think that's a brilliant moment to kind of intervene and, um, you know, go for video. Like, um, you know, I'm working with a client at the moment who's, um, their entire industry has spammed the hell out of Google. And, um, you know, there's just no interesting content going on at this higher um, you know, higher up the chain. And so video for them is like a really good opportunity. And so it doesn't have to be about, you don't have to specifically just answer the question about uh, content purely in the context of itself. Look at, you can make decisions about what the best media type is based on how the search results are that you're targeting, and what's the quality of video in the search results you're targeting, what's the quality of images, slide shares, presentations, all these things in the search results you're targeting, and therefore target a new asset type or a better version of that asset uh, to, to rank in Google. Yeah, on that note, when they talked about tools, one of the tools that I do like for video that wasn't mentioned is search metrics and mm -hmm. their history of SERPs and video. Man, if there's no video on a SERP and you go to their data and see, oh, there has been video before, guess what you should be targeting? Video, yep. my friend, because all that means is that uh, the video that was there stop getting clicks, they're looking for another video to put in there. That's yeah. kind of my uh, strategy on that. Greg, your thoughts? Yeah, one of the things that um, I'll be sharing at SES Toronto uh, during the session that you and I are speaking in is, is in the mm, not-so-distant past, um, video was probably pigeonholed at the early part of whatever funnel model somebody's working with because all you could really do is measure your success in views. I got a lot of views. Hopefully that means that a lot of people are aware of my product now uh, and let's hope mysteriously they arrive some way to my website and buy a product. What has happened, particularly in the last year, year and a half, is f first of all with the call to action overlay on um, TrueView videos. And then last fall, with the addition of the associated website annotation on YouTube, you can now take those videos and literally drive traffic to a landing page from a video. And I think what that means is, is all of us now have to take a second look at where video is in our so-called funnel model. Because if you can generate leads with a video, then pardon me, it's right down near the bottom of the funnel. Um, yeah. Oh, by the way, it also works at the top of the funnel. Oh, by the way, it sort of works in the middle of the funnel. And so it really comes down to, you know, who's your target audience? What's the next step you're trying to get them to take? And is video an appropriate uh, tactic to help them take that step? More often than not, the answer is yes. Yeah, I... I uh... We noticed when we started putting videos on our uh, uh, product pages for the music company right away, uh, we, we felt that it was helping quite a lot. And these were just basically players playing the instruments. Uh, 
I, I'm a strong believer that the video is one of the biggest uh, tools you can get used to get a message across. Because the other thing is, people read all of a post before they actually make up their mind about a textual post. Whereas you can create with emotion and trigger emotion with video almost within seconds if you're doing it right. So that's another big difference between the two. And if you utilize that properly, uh, I think you can really go to improving conversion using that kind of uh, mindset because uh, emotion is how a lot of people buy. You have to trigger certain emotions. Uh, thoughts? Right. Even even for B2B categories like supply chain management. Yep. One of the one of the examples I'm going to show up in Toronto is Canaxis and and their Sweet Mates series of YouTube videos, funny videos, poking fun at um, a made up competitor who probably looks suspiciously like a real competitor, but it doesn't matter because they made up the name and therefore they can get away with that. But the point is, is that they can make points in their humorous videos that would sound uh, a little tacky if a sales rep was making them on a sales call. Um, and oh, by the way, it uh, increased their leads, not just their traffic, their leads to their website uh, by over um, uh, a, two, a factor of over 2x. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say uh, like features and benefits, you may as well just cover that all off in video um, and get so that your sales team can get down to like a proper chat about the practicalities of, of you know, this customer actually buying the product. Um, yeah, I, just, I think nowadays, okay, there's, I mean, there's definitely stuff around emotion, but I think I, if I find that there's a website and I'm interested in the tool or the product, if I can't watch a video to kind of get a quick two-minute summary of it, I'm always a bit disappointed. Equally, if I have to sit through a ten-minute video to find out the same information, I'm really disappointed too. Yeah, I think uh, keeping things as short as possible and as direct as possible is usually the best uh, way to go about videos. Uh, short and sweet get your message across, be done. Uh, that has to do with, uh, what's the average time, around three minutes for a video on? Uh, well, it, it used to be, it used to be three minutes. Okay. According to Comscore, the average video is now watched over five minutes. And ah. so I think a couple of things have, uh, have taken place. One of which is people are now making better videos, right. okay? Um, and in some cases, people are discovering that particularly if they want to drive traffic or leads, you need to tell a story, and often it, it takes a little more time to tell a good story. True. Also, what do you think about maybe the effect of uh, Hangouts on that, uh, uh, Greg? With, now there's a lot more longer content because of YouTube and the Hangouts, because more people can make longer videos now with Hangouts, right? They do, and I've seen some of them used quite effectively, particularly in sports. I saw an interview the other day with uh, Tiger Woods that was a half hour long. It was in a Hangout. Um, and, and again, you know, um, longer than the quick hit that you'd even see on cable television. But um, if you were really into, you know, what he had to say, um, et cetera, et cetera, a half hour was okay. And the most shared uh, video of 2012 that was not, let's say, a music video or something like that was Coney 2012, which was a video to bring people's awareness to a warlord in Africa. It was 30 minutes long. It has, you know, 100 million views, and it was shared 10 million times. Interesting. Hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm watching long-form right, content now on my PS3 that's 
source from YouTube. You know, I've got the YouTube app, app on my PS3. I think all of that's just going to increase. And, you know, you've got Xbox getting behind trying to be, you know, the kind of home. Xbox One is going to be like the complete entertainment center. And, um, you know, one interesting thing that came out of, like, the last gen, this generation of uh, gaming consoles is just how much streaming media everyone's interested in. So, um, yeah, I can see YouTube just carrying on with that, and there definitely is more opportunity for people to go straight to YouTube uh, to put their long-form content up rather than try and kind of solicit media channels and stuff like that. And actually, in New York, there's a lot of there's a big community of writers and film production people who are um, deliberately, you know, heading straight to YouTube to get their, you know, get their video series pilots done and stuff like that. Yeah, I think there's a, a younger crowd too that just would rather watch video than watch uh, than than text anyhow. It's just the new generation. We like gentlemen like me and Greg. We grew up reading books, uh, you know. And you probably were uh, up from books, probably a little more television than we got when we were younger. Now these kids are not reading books. They're not really watching TV. They're gaming on those consoles and watching stuff on vid on YouTube on video. That's. Uh, I like watching Dave's young. He's got two young kids, and that's we learned so much from watching their habits of what's going to happen in the future. Uh, Greg's smiling. I think he uh, agrees with me. <laughs> yeah, I remember black and white TV. You remember those days? Yeah, oh for sure. <laughs> First hockey games I watched on black and white. Uh... Okay, that. Well, I think the key. Behavior change is that it's video on demand now is like de facto. We're not people are just not tuning in at nine PM on a Friday night. Like even for Game of Thrones, you know, which is really popular. I don't know, I bet you um how much they watch on a Sunday compared to how much is watched on demand. Um I bet it's equal. And actually, that's what's interesting about Netflix. Netflix have clearly identified that people would rather watch an entire series in two days than uh, than wait every week for um, you know the next episode. So if you can get that on-demand mentality and build that into your your strategy, well, I think. Here in Canada, uh, our cable company used to charge extra for on-demand. Now it's all uh, just piece of the action. Unless you want to get it on a device, then they charge you more. But for me to watch stuff on demand, not movies, but shows and stuff, it's free. No, no charge. They're realizing people want to watch TV, not necessarily at 9 o'clock a program. They want to watch when it's convenient for them. And more and more TVs getting that... Uh, uh, vibe that hey we can't schedule stuff anymore. They're gonna watch it when they want. Okay. Anyhow, uh, pretty much gone through the hour, and I promised Greg and uh, uh, Jonathan they're both busy gentlemen, not like me, uh, beating a life of leisure and uh, penniless. But th there you go. Uh, so we're gonna have to. Uh, Kind of end this now. It's been about an hour. Great. I, I'm looking forward to our uh, uh, presentation together. JC, always great to hang out with you and uh, my friends from the dojo. Always, uh, you know, a pleasure. So, uh, any last words from you guys? Um, if you need a closing remark, go to SES Toronto. 2013 in June and there's going to be more stuff new case studies more tips uh, you know see you there yeah thanks Greg I, I'm sure uh, be lots of people there now uh, we've impressed them I'm sure uh, Jonathan 
Um, it's been fun, and yeah, you know, start start using search results as a mean to work out what asset type you can optimize for, not just uh, not optimizing for just top of the engine. And pay attention to top C and second screen hashtags. Do a bit of mining in there because there's lots of interesting stuff coming out of that. Yeah, that's true. The hashtags on Twitter are getting a little uh, exposure. So with that, uh, we'll call it a day. And uh, as usual, I'll end it like I do all broadcasts, folks. Go make lots of money using video and the social network. Okay, folks, see you later. Bye, Terry. Thanks, guys. Take care.